Right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Dave Pridland, and uh, I work for a company called Shorevine, and they pay for me to come here, so I might as well put their logo on things. Um, Hello. Hello. So, uh, Shorevine do uh, secure collaboration with uh, people who really, really care about security, which is um, what draws me into this kind of area. Uh, but this is mostly, uh, mostly uh, just a, a hobby project that I've developed and we've taken on as a, uh, as a bit of a product. So XMPP looks a bit like this on, on, a, on a sort of a network diagram. You have clients uh, which talk to servers and servers talk to other servers. Uh, if we add in another client, it looks much the same. But you see that clients don't talk to clients, it's only that servers talk to servers. If you add in another domain, then you get, um, and certainly please admire these lines, they took me ages. The blinky lines are, CSS animation, animations, really impressive I thought. So um, these, uh, you get domains talking to domains, talking to domains, they all do full mesh and the clients just hang off particular servers. But the problem with this is it's not uh, a, a really sensible view of the world because these two domains are both Montague, they're both probably on, on the same um, physical server, so in fact they're probably in the same process, let alone the same organization. So the way that, uh, the way that I tend to think about XMPP is like this. You have a set of um, if we're going to use posh language, autonomous security domains, um, which I have within them, they operate their own security policy. They uh, they they set the they set the rules. Um, the clients live within those. The the servers live within those. Everything, and then they have borders, and then they send traffic past those borders into. In this case, Capulet sending to House Verona and House Montague to ages of Shakespearean research to figure out a third one there. Um, so, what's meter? Um, well, I like to call it a borderline server, but uh, marketing told me that I can't. So, um, it's maybe an, uh, an S to S proxy, a server to server proxy is, is one way of looking at it, a border gateway, although that's possibly a bit misleading. Um, yeah, an, SB, an, an SBC in SIP terms, uh, but XMPB doesn't have those. And a, a perimeter filter is another way of looking at it. Um, there is another way of looking at it, but we don't mention that. Um, so where does it fit in this diagram? Because I, I've got to put it in the diagram somewhere. And the answer is, well, it kind of doesn't, because the, the, this diagram doesn't change. What we're doing is meter lives in these lines here, in these boxes. It acts as the border, it acts as the perimeter. So Capulet servers, how many it has, connect to the, its meter as if it's Montague. They, they don't really care, they're just connecting out. Um, so OpenFire, ProCD, both have overrides to let you do this very, very nice and simply. Um, meter then pretends to be Capulet as it connects to Montague's servers. So it is uh, fronting Capulet. Uh, I don't like that word pretends though because it implies that it's doing something wrong. Uh, there's lots of words that sound really wrong here. Spoofs, fakes, masquerades, all of these have to go. What it's doing is it's, it's, it authenticates as Capulet to Montague. It's, it's legitimately acting that way. Um, so quick reminder of how authentication works in server-to-server -server in XMPP because uh, not everyone will remember this straight off and it's a bit complicated. Originally we had dial back that was our first attempt at security in server-to-server -server, and it looks roughly that you've got two connections, one connection comes in says hello I'm, uh, hello, you know, hey Bob it's Alice. The receiving server then connects back to the originating server and just checks that it's the right connection. And if it is, then we're all good. Um, Dialback is reliant on DNS. And here's a, uh, an alternative fact quote from Trump explaining how good DNS is. Um, DNS can be spoofed. It's, there, there are problems there. We've never had a problem in the XMPP network, as far as I'm aware, but it's not good to re rely on it. So You wouldn't know. So maybe we should do DNSSEC. And so DNSSEC, secure DNS, I mean it basically it's the, 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 the TLS for DNS, I don't know, I, I call it what you like. It, it means that you can rely on 
the DNS data at a cryptographic level. And this gives us something called securely derived reference identifiers, which are to do with... It's, it's not TLS, it's signing of records. Hush now. It's getting certificates, right? Um, no, it's... So for, for TLS, um, in XMPP terms, we always have to check the certificate for the domain and not the host. Unless we've got DNSSEC, at which point it's the host as well. Yeah, unless there's Dane, at which point it might be neither, or we might be doing something else with, uh, with fingerprinting entirely. So there's a lot of variations there. Um, TLS with XMPP is opportunistic. Uh, we use the start TLS model, um, which was uh, sort of pioneered by ACAP, as I'm sure you're all familiar with ACAP. I like to slip ACAP into every talk. Um, except that we've actually developed a, a, a quite recent spec, uh, ZEP368, um, where it acts more like HTTPS, where it operates on a separate port. So there are, again, a lot of variations. Sorry, I did these last night when I was drunk. Um, so Meta supports a selection of standards as beyond the, uh, the basic XMPP. And uh, I, I'm sure you all know what all of these are. So ZEP220 is? Dialback. Dialback, yeah. ZEP344. No. Uh, that's dial back with TLS. Uh, and then there's 361, that's SATCOM, XMPP over SATCOM. Uh, Meter supports that as well for low bandwidth situations. 368, we've mentioned, immediate mode TLS. Uh, 6125, TLSP kicks off. Um, a rather obscure one because nobody seems to reference it. It's quite useful. Um, 433 to 35 is DNSSEC. Uh, 5280 is PKX and CRLs. We have Should to do CRL Bosch. checking. What's that? Should have been Bosch. <laughs> um, and then uh, we've got Dane and Dane SRV. So there's quite a lot there. Um, the other features it can do are, th are lots and lots and lots of per domain controls so that you can tweak the cipher list to particular domains. You can uh, tweak the, uh, the DH parameter length to particular domains if you want and as, as well as whether you're enforcing TLS or not. It also handles DNS overrides. That, oh, I should have really logged out, shouldn't I? Um, it, um, say hello to Chris. Uh, so um, DNS overrides allow you to override what connection it's, uh, what, what server it's connecting to, and everyone's coming on offline. I really should have, should have thought of that before. Um, it allows you to inject SRV records, and it allows you to, thank you, Edwin, uh, and it allows you to um, inject TLSA records so that you can do certificate pinning via injected Dane records if you want, uh, which is, again, you know, useful. Uh, quick trip around the internals. How am I doing for time? Okay. Uh, tr quick ri trip around the internals. It's uh, written in C++11 uh, with bits of... 14 as I gradually gradually got to uh, got familiar with them. So that might give you some idea of how long I've been working on this now. Um, all of the code and all of its operations are assumed to be security sensitive, which, which has certain implications on the design. You know, it's, it's assumed that it is internet facing, it is assumed that it is right on the, on the perimeter, it is assumed that every configuration option has a security impact. Um, it's designed to be sysadmin friendly. It doesn't have users. Users don't connect to it. Uh, it's designed to be support friendly so that we can build, so Shorebind can build support contracts. Um, and it's designed, once all of those are, are dealt with, it is designed to be very, very fast at switching, at switching stanzas, XMPP sort of packet equivalent. Uh, to go through a bit more detail, I think this was actually Edwin. It was, there you go. Um, that's why I picked C++11, because it's, it's, it's really nice. No other reason, really. Security, there is no web interface. Um, it's just a straightforward flat config file. You edit it with operating system security. Um, there's, there isn't even any SIGHUP support, because I decided that when I looked at it, to work out exactly which, which connections had to be restarted for a given config change, I simply thought it was too high a risk, so that's gone. It does have pretty terrible testing, I, I will um, admit that. Um, if if uh, any of you are Google Summer of, the, Summer of Code students, I would love to, uh, to see some approaches to, to a, uh, a test framework for this. Um, 
On the other hand, the code is uh, very carefully statically analyzed and, uh, and it's uh, exploratory tested fairly well. But um, as far as sysadmin friendly goes, well, XML config file? Do we like XML? I don't know. I, I, I like it. Um, it has smart cascading defaults, so a changing, a changing a global will have an effect on other dependent, uh, other dependent settings to make them uh, the, the sensible default given the global, this sort of thing. It also has a runtime config dump, which I'll come on to a bit at the moment. But it, it really comes into its own when you're dealing with support. So by a runtime config dump, the config file that it reads in, it will then write out the entire configuration um, into a file. This is actually an example of part of the config file. Um, screen's not wide enough. But you'll see that not only do it, does it write out all the settings, including any defaults, any derived settings, so it includes like the fact that we're checking PKIX status and this sort of thing. It, it also includes comments about the uh, configuration. So we, we, so in order to figure out exactly what your running configuration really is, you have a complete snapshot of it, including any reference certificates, keys, the, the whole lot put in the data directory so that you can find it and examine it and uh, yeah, potentially examine it for changes. Uh, so fast switching means very few buffer copies. Um, very fast parsing, uh, I use a, a fork of Rapid XML, which I've enhanced a bit. Um, and that, one of the things that Rapid XML allows us to do is skip XML reserialization. Um, reserialization is, uh, is at least as slow as parsing, so if we can skip it, we've skipped half the time. And what I mean by this is here's a, here's a stanza, and we've got the, what we tend to refer to as a stanza header. Um, the sort of the, the message tags themselves and what we can do is we can extract this string here and simply copy it from one buffer to another. Uh, Rapid XML allows us to do this. It makes it very, very fast to, to move stanzas from one interface to another, which keeps the latency very nice and low. So uh, as I say, I, uh, I wrote these while I was drunk. And so. What, uh, what can we do now? Because we are sitting in this, in this diagram on these edges. Now that we're there and we've established the, uh, the security between these at a, at a basic communications level, what else can we do with this? So um, Meta has a concept of filters which allow you to read in the stanzas as they're going through, uh, perhaps choose to discard them, uh, perhaps choose to create new ones. Um, so that we can respond to traffic that before it hits the, uh, the real server and uh, uh, potentially alter them. Only I haven't actually written the API for that, but you can always just discard and, and create new ones, so it's not a, a huge deal. Um, the examples that I got, the XMPP world has a, uh, has a problem with Russian spam at the moment, so just as, a, just as a proof of concept, I knocked out something that will take Unicode code blocks and go, yeah, it contains this one, and I don't speak any Russian, uh, despite having Russian friends, and so I can drop those packets on the floor and my spam goes away. That's very, very nice, although quite brutal. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting proof of concept. Um, a slightly more interesting one is this. Uh, Disco is the uh, capability discovery mechanism in XMPP. And what we can do is, um, as Disco requests come in, so for the discovery, uh, we can hand back a previous discovery response so that again that never passes through. Now, this in combination with uh, use of meter in, in, for example, SATCOM, when you've got very slow links, can save quite a large amount of traffic. Those so, SMTP servers already have the ability to cache client yeah. uh, discos? Uh, at least one does, because I put I it in there before. One does, uh, because, okay. yeah. <laughs> Um, so, what's on the roadmap? <laughs> um, on the roadmap, uh, we can, we, we've got the, the functionality, so what else can we do? We could, um, we could actually suppress, maybe inject client capabilities, um, which seems like a useful trick to be able to do. So we can, instead of uh, many blocking, say, file transfer traffic, if you don't want to allow that across your perimeter, we might, say, we might start saying, well, actually, this, 
this client can't even do file transfer, don't offer it, which improves the user experience instead of simply blocking traffic. Um, other things we can do, speaking of file transfer, we can intercept, maybe bridge between, uh, so that we can inject uh, file transfer proxies, things like this, um, strip out internal network addresses on uh, on peer-to-peer -peer sessions, um, maybe even check files, maybe even dump them in and, uh, and virus scan them on the way through. So we've got, uh, a, again, a large number of options, things that you want to do on your perimeter. Um, Finally, security labeling. Um, like I say, Shorevine works in, in some high security environments, although we mostly use security labeling in cyber threat intelligence in the enterprise world. Um, we've already got a, uh, a complete security labeling implementation. It's called Spiffing. I did a lightning talk on that last year. And so we can actually build in a, a policy enforcement point, check labels against clearances, um, exciting things like that. And we can, do, uh, we can do more than that. I'm really keen to, if anybody is a, a potential Google Summer of Code student, um, I'm really keen to, uh, to, to see what people can do with this. Um, you will be, uh, we'll be working within the, uh, the, X, the XMPP Standard Foundation as an umbrella group for Google of Summer of Code. And, uh, and if, you're, if you're able to, uh, to pitch in an idea, I'm really, I'm all ears. So with that, Ooh, I make it three minutes, 20 seconds. Um, are there any questions? Have you done interop tests between Meta and other servers, or other border servers, edge servers? Well, there is only one of them. I know. And, and y you develop it. I know. So you can answer that question yourself, which would be not yet. Right. Um, but I, I have discussed, uh, discussed this uh, with uh, your CEO, in fact. And he said yes. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's very much on the cards. Because much as we like to have well, the, the entire pie, obviously, um, if we don't, we should at least interoperate. Indeed, yeah. Because there have been too many problems with interop. Very much so. I mean, I, I run meter in production against my own, uh, protecting my own server. So I'm confident that it works with a wide range of servers. But, uh, but yeah, formal interop testing, uh, particularly with SATCOM. Site common labeling, yeah, absolutely. Got a question here. Okay. So, uh, for myself, uh, is, a, is it open source? And if so, where is it? It is open source, and I really should have put the GitHub repository on here, shouldn't I? It is uh, open source. Otherwise, that would be really embarrassing coming here and talking about something that wasn't, wouldn't it? Oh, that's what I was uh, Yeah, so it's MIT licensed, and it is on uh, GitHub. It's within my GitHub. Um, you can look for meter within uh, my GitHub handle is DWD, Delta Whiskey Delta. Um, do you see that, uh, that the issue that you uh, don't see the road IP is it an issue or something you would like to solve? I mean, that's in the inner, inner, in, within the parameter, you don't see the remote IP of the other entity. Um, no, you don't. Uh, that's because you will see meters IP address yeah, from the inside. Is that a problem? Um, a problem you want to solve? It's only a problem if you're trying to do security and perimeter security on the inside, but. I'm assuming that you do the perimeter security within meter. Okay. So I'm thinking not. Go on, I got one minute, 13 seconds. Anyone else? Marcus, I think you've made some time. Thank you.